the Kansas Jayhawks, America's team. Yes, that's right. Nobody, and I mean nobody, has surprised the college football world quite like Kansas. It is Friday, October 7th. You're listening to the College Football Daily. I'm your host, Lance Glenn. Before we start, I just want to remind everyone to like this video and subscribe to the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. And if you're listening to this episode as a podcast, make sure to give us a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. The Jayhawks are 5-0 and for the first time since 2009, and that has brought both excitement and a little bit of uncertainty as head coach Lance Leipold's name has been mentioned quite often in the coaching carousel. This weekend, for the first time, College Game Day is in fact heading to Kansas as the Jayhawks host TCU for what is crazy to say, frankly, a top 20 matchup. Yes, that's right, a top 20 Big 12 matchup of undefeated teams nonetheless. So joining me to discuss the program and both its near and long-term future is Michael Swain. He covers Kansas for 24-7 sports, fog.net. Michael, how are we doing, man? Thanks so much for joining me and for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a exciting times in Lawrence and a, a busy week for all of us on the beat with the college game day and everything, but exciting times to say the least. So Michael, if I told you before the season started that at the halfway point of the year for most teams, week six, not only would college game day be heading to Lawrence for the game against TCU, but to add on to that, it would be a top 20 Big 12 matchup between undefeated teams fighting for the conference lead. How crazy would you have thought I was at the time to even think that? But with everything that happens, you know, how insane is it that all those things I just mentioned are true and all this is real on Saturday? It's incredible. For Kansas fans, it's like a fever dream because for so long it's been incompetent football and it's been hard to watch and fans haven't shown up as a result and you can't blame them. Going into the season, you're thinking, okay, right? You showed progress over the last three weeks of last season, right? You have the big win over Texas, but then you play TCU and West Virginia close. So you're thinking, okay, for the you know 2022, this should be the, the building year where, okay, you play close games, you win four games, and four games would still be the most wins this team has had in over a decade, right? So that was even – you're saying four wins preseason? You're thinking, okay, that's like – that's a great season and they can build off of that, but to have it go the way it has, has just been impressive. And I didn't see it coming. I was of the opinion, Hey, if you can go three and nine and play in 10, one score games or nine, one score games, that's a fantastic season. You can recruit off that. You can recruit off the improvement, but to see it happen like this is surprising. And I think it's a, it's a little shocking. I think just in general to have the eyes of college football, right? 3 million people on Saturday morning, We'll be watching a show based out of Lawrence, Kansas in November. Yeah, absolutely. And again, when you think a show going to Lawrence, Kansas, you think of college game day in the basketball season, right? You th- you'd think uh, of them, you know, playing a either a conference matchup against Baylor, um, you know, in basketball, not necessarily in football or against TCU in basketball, not mm-hmm. necessarily in football, but, but here we are in October and college game day uh, is going to be there. And like you said, millions of people, We'll be watching a show based in Lawrence, Kansas. And and you mentioned something interesting, how this, had they won four games, let's say, hypothetically, it would have been the first four-win season in, in over a decade. And I think Kansas coming into the year was still at a point where moral victories were okay, you know, making sure they just kept games competitive against, you know, the Big 12's best. But the fact that they've done what they've done so far – I mean, could you have have seen this coming at all? I know you talked about how at the end of the season they played games tougher. You obviously beat Texas towards the end of the year. They played Oklahoma for a while tough as well. So you saw kind of those pieces being put into place. But I mean, five and zero was five and zero. And and you know, say what you want about the first half of their schedule: Iowa State, West Virginia, uh, among others that they've beaten. I mean, this this no way anyone covering the beat, not just you, could have foreseen a start like this happening. No, and I think you look at it too, right? What KU has done has gone on the road. And I think that for me has been maybe the more impressive part because before the season you looked at it and looked at the schedule and you say, okay, you know, Tennessee Tech is a win. And then your winnable games are West Virginia and Duke. And that's how you get to three, right? And then after that, it's kind of like, all right, you flip the coin and, and see what happens. And for them to go on the road in week two and beat West Virginia in the way that they beat them, they were down 14 to nothing and came storming back. And that's kind of been the story of KU season at times has been they've really dominated the second and third quarters of these games. And that's what they did in Morgantown. But then 
they let it slip at the end. This is still a team that's learning how to win games, and they let it slip at the end. It goes to overtime, and they get the pick six and the rare double-digit victory, right, in overtime. And then, you know, the next week you have a tough road trip at Houston, right, the team that's picked to win the AAC. You embarrass them. You got players getting in a fight on the sidelines during the game on the Houston sideline. You know, it's things that like that that I think were maybe impressive that, you know, each week you're kind of having to reassess, well, okay, here, like what exactly is the ceiling for this team? And I think after that Houston game, you kind of realize, wow, this is a a bold caliber team because you've just gone on the road back to back weeks and, and beaten teams that frankly are probably more talented, right? You know, talented, if you will, but teams that are probably further along in their development. And then all of a sudden you go back and it's okay. Well, now you've got Duke and that's the game everyone circled as, Hey, this should be a winnable game. And then you go and dominate Duke. The scoreline probably doesn't do it justice. You know how dominant key was in that game. But, and then last week, I think Iowa state is kind of really the first like litmus test game for KU this year where you're like, okay, four, no, they've beaten some okay teams. And here comes a young Iowa state team that is going to be well-disciplined. They're going to be tough. And, you know, to be frank, KU tried to give the game away. And Iowa State gave it right back with some missed kicks. But you don't give wins back. And for a long time, those are the type of games that KU would be in, but they would find ways to lose. And and it's kind of the reverse where the other team found the way to lose. And so that's been kind of the change. And, and now all of a sudden you enter this week and it's, all right, this is probably a, a legitimate test. TCU is really good. And this will kind of tell us where we're kind of at with KU and the development of, of where the program really is this season. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, you know, you can't take away wins. A win is a win, no matter how it happens. Uh, all that matters is that at the end of the game, you have more points than the other team. And so far through five weeks in every single game Kansas has. So nobody has jolted Kansas's rise more than quarterback Jalen Daniels. And his personal maturation as a quarterback has been really fun to watch. He's taken a big step this year in a lot of ways compared to his play of years past. Turnovers are down. I know he only started down the stretch in 2021, so it wasn't really a full season. But so far in 2022, he's really using his legs as a weapon. He's grown as a passer, too. What do you credit for this rise and in his play and really him vaulting into Heisman consideration? Well, I, I think for the Jalen Daniels story, you have to go back to his freshman year, right? COVID 2020, he shows up in the summer. And all of a sudden, a few weeks later, is playing as a 17-year-old in front of probably one of the worst offensive lines KU's had in, in recent memory. And so he took his lumps that year physically. And I think he learned at that point that, okay, like I'm going to have to put on weight. And he has, over the last years, bulked up. Where now you see him, he's cut. When he carries the ball, he looks like he can take hits. And so then last season, he probably would have started if he didn't get hurt during training camp. And then he was going to redshirt, and then the, Jason being the quarterback gets hurt, and all of a sudden, boom, really the, the program changed in that Texas game. And I think the decision for Jalen Daniels not to take that redshirt after the Texas game I think speaks a lot to the culture that KU is trying to install. And the fact that Daniels put the team ahead of his own eligibility I think really struck with the team. And I think over this offseason, Daniels has taken his game to another level. I don't think anyone ever saw him becoming a dual threat quarterback like he has. He did not run the ball on designed runs in years past. It's been a lot of, oh, okay, he's scrambling and shows his athleticism that way. But this coaching staff has built the offense around his skill set, which is a, a talented arm, but also a guy that that has some decent speed and, and has some really good smarts in terms of the option plays. And so all of a sudden what you're seeing now is a guy that's a really a, a huge dual threat quarterback. And it's, it's funny to think back Les miles when he was the coach um, signed Daniels and came out and said that he reminds me a little bit of Cam Newton. And I think a lot of people on the beat were kind of like, okay, like that's, that's high, you know, three years later and you're like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. If you look at the ESPN total QBR, you know, Daniels is the second highest QBR in the history of the metric right? Only behind Mac Jones at Alabama, his uh, senior season, I want to say. So you're looking at a quarterback that has just elevated the offense. He makes everyone better. It's like the saying, um, a rising tide lifts all boats. And that's what he's done with this offense because they didn't add a ton this offseason. They added some running backs, but it's basically the same offense you saw last year, which wasn't great. And I think Daniel's level of play overall has really just elevated everyone, whether it be the offensive line, the tight ends, the wide receivers, the running backs, everyone is playing at a higher level because of Jalen Daniels. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll talk more about the 5-0 and Kansas Jayhawks. You're listening to the College Football Daily.
Back here on the College Football Daily, joined by Michael Swain of 24-7 Sports Fog. Dot net covering the Kansas Jayhawks. So, Michael, this game starts a difficult stretch for Kansas. TCU at home at Oklahoma and Baylor, then the bye week. Then they host Oklahoma State. They end with Texas Tech in Lubbock, home against Texas, and the final game at Kansas State. What do you think moving forward now are reasonable expectations for the Jayhawks? You know, I doubt an undefeated season happens, and, you know, for all we know, it very well could. I could be the ultimate jinx. But what can we anticipate from them now in the second half of the year? Well, I think now we're really going to see where this program really is at because you had this really good start to the season and you've beat up on the teams that looking ahead in years to come, you need to beat if you're going to be a bowl team in the new Big 12, right? And that's a good starting point for Kansas. Become a bowl team, perennial bowl team. That's a great start. But is KU a Big 12 title contender? We'll find out in the next few weeks because if KU wins on Saturday, goes into Norman, say they lose – you're looking at that and you're like, okay, they've qualified for bowl eligibility for the first time since 2008. They have one loss in the Big 12. And then basically you've got your kind of tough games against Baylor and Oklahoma State at home. And so I think you look at these next few games and this will tell us a lot about where this program is at. Can they keep these games competitive? That's a huge part of this. TCU's offense is legit. And their defense has probably the best team speed that Key has gone against all season. In a game like that, where I think the talent gap can be shown, right? K's players are not going to be as athletic, as fast as TCU's players. Can they still manage to keep a game close? Can they manage to win a game like that? If they are, I think all of a sudden you're looking at it and saying, okay, maybe this is a, a dark horse Big 12 title contender team. Now, if they lose to TCU, it's not the end of the world, right? You've still got several weeks to try and get that six win to claim bowl eligibility, but it is a tough stretch, right? You know, if you're looking at the schedule, you really thought you had to get the wins early because later on it gets tough. And I think the last thing a KU fan wants to do is go into Manhattan, Kansas on the road to play Kansas state on a six game losing streak um, and needing one win to claim bowl eligibility. That is a nightmare scenario for Kansas fans. And so I think over the next few weeks, it's really about, okay, can you play competitive football and can you get that one win to clinch bowl eligibility? So that when you do go play Kansas state, the last game of the season, it can be a free hit, right? Really, you know, you're just trying to end the losing streak against your in-state rival. It's not going to have a ton else on the line. So I think between now and then, it's just about where does that one win come, maybe two wins to where it ends up being a successful season. The team can get rewarded in postseason play. I think in terms of development for a program, having those extra practices in December are huge in terms of just building up the depth and the younger players in the program. So I think there is a lot at stake here over the next few weeks in terms of just the long-term trajectory and the fuel within the program. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned the the practices that come with the bowl game and you talk to a lot of coaches. Sure. They want to win the bowl game, but for a program that's developing like Kansas still, those practices, those extra practices, frankly, might mean more than the game and yeah. being able to develop some of those younger players might mean more than, than winning a bowl game, especially when you look, Long term, and before we do look long term, I do want to quickly pivot to the short term. And with the short term, as I've mentioned, a top twenty matchup on Saturday against TCU and Lawrence. So, fill in the blank for me, please. Kansas wins the game if they do blank. If they stay on schedule, offensively, you look at the KU offense; they were averaging forty plus points per game, and they still are. And it shows a lot about how much they were scoring that they score fourteen points and. For the season, they're still averaging over 40 points per game. But you look through the first you know, four weeks of the season, KU was scoring a ton. And the reason they were scoring a ton, they were keeping defenses off balance. On first and second down, they were making it so it's third and three, third and two, so that the playbook can kind of be open. And this is what KU faced last season, where they couldn't stop the run. So their defensive coordinator all game was having to call plays against you know third and two, third and three. And he talked about how tough that is. And this year, it's been the opposite, where offensive coordinator Andy Kotelnicki has really put those defenses under pressure. But against Iowa State, they couldn't run the ball as well, and they really struggled. They averaged 2.2 yards per play in the second half. They averaged uh, a third down distance to go of seven yards. If they do that against TCU, it's a recipe for a, a long day, I think, because if you give that secondary in that just team in general with that team speed, the man coverage that they're going to play on the outside, if you let those guys tee off, all game on third and seven and third and long, it's going to be really hard to put up points. And I just don't know if KU's defense, right? They did against Iowa State, but that Iowa State offense is not great. 
right? They haven't really scored against a power five opponent that well this season. So if KU's defense doesn't have that same type of performance, I think it's be really tough for KU to stay in this game if they're constantly having to convert on those third and longs. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, a TCU offense that put up 50 plus points against Oklahoma last week, we saw how lethal they can be. And if Kansas's offense can't move the ball, if they can't sustain drives, TCU gets more possessions. That is certainly not a recipe for success for the Jayhawks. So, Michael, I want to look long term now before we go. Lance Leibold has engineered the turnaround of the program, obviously. But like I mentioned at the start, the season so far has brought with it uncertainty as to his future at Kansas. Nebraska and Wisconsin are both open jobs. You've heard his name linked to them already. That Wisconsin one, I think, is the bigger threat with obviously his ties to the state. And frankly, any big job moving forward that opens up, Lance Leipold, I'm sure, will be at the top of the list of potential candidates. So with you around the program every day and Lance Leipold obviously being such a hot target, what is the just general feel throughout the building around the head coach's future? And frankly, if this season could be his last one in Lawrence? Well, if you ask people around the program, it's all steam ahead. It's we can't control what's going to happen in November and December. What we can control is our preparation for TCU. And you got to get people around the program, the players, the assistant coaches. You got to give them credit for that. The fans are getting a little angsty because each week a new person is connecting Lance Leipold to Nebraska or to Wisconsin. And I think if you're looking at Lance Leipold, right, he's approaching 60. So it's not necessarily a long term, right? He's not going to coach for another 15 years. This isn't like a Matt Campbell scenario where he's young and you think this is your head coach for the next decade plus. Um, and the issue with it is, is Lance Lapple has ties to both of those programs. You look at Nebraska, right? He coached at Nebraska. He coached at Nebraska Omaha on two different stints. He's from Wisconsin. He was a GA at Wisconsin. So these are two programs that I think going into Kansas, when he first came to Kansas, you're like, okay, if Lance Leipold leaves, obviously it's great because it means the program's in a good spot, but he'd probably leave for two programs, and that is Wisconsin and maybe Nebraska. And so I think that has added to the concern amongst the fan base. And now the question is, if you look at Wisconsin, all right, does Leonard get the full-time job, and does that save KU there? Does Nebraska want to go after a flashy hire and a splashy hire? And I give Lance Leipold credit. He's come out and said, hey, me and my wife and my family, we're happy right now, and our plan is not to go anywhere. I'd respond and say, that's nice, but plans change, especially when you're looking at a school potentially doubling your salary, right? And maybe money isn't everything for him. I don't think it is. I think he and Matt Campbell are incredibly similar. Both had D3 backgrounds, both have worked their way up to the MAC, to the Big 12. I don't think money is everything for Lance Leipold. I think his reputation I think the ability to be a builder is what he's kind of hung his hat on during his career, right? He's been a serial winner, several D3 titles, goes to the MAC, makes Buffalo a title contender. And if you check Buffalo's record, it's not gone well since he left either. So, and then now you look at Kansas. And the thing about it is, I think Mark Mangino said it to Dennis Dodd of CBS. If you win at Kansas, they will crawl on nails for you. And guess what winning at Kansas is? It's going seven and five. It's going six and six. It's having a great season going eight and four. Those are not the expectations at a Nebraska or at a Wisconsin. Those are teams that want to win their division, um, the Big Ten West. That's what they want to win. For KU and the new Big 12, it's going to be about can you be a perennial bowl team? And once every four years, once every five years, when you have a lot of seniors, can you go compete for a Big 12 title? And so it's going to be a fascinating next few months to see how those coaching searches pan out because – Obviously, there's Lance. Now you look at offensive coordinator Andy Kornicki getting linked to that Georgia Tech job. I think he's one that will be a hot commodity this offseason if the offense can continue to score points against these Big 12 defenses. So looking at the coaching staff, continuity has been a thing under Lance Leipold. He does not like to have assistants come and go, but success brings more eyeballs, and more eyeballs means people are going to like what you have, and they're going to want to have what you have as well. So it does create a Interesting scenario, I think, for when you get into that kind of November, December, and then into January when kind of the assistant pool starts to swirl a little bit, that KU's going to have to probably bring out the checkbook to keep a lot of these people in Lawrence. And I think the athletic department feels better about the football program to where I think they'll be willing to do that. Yeah, and and you bring up a good point. You know, it's not just Lance Leipold, uh, but it's the assistants as well. You know, it's whether it's a lower level power five job like a Georgia Tech or it's a group of five job uh, that could potentially open up. And it's so interesting to see, right, with the coaching carousel is like, 
okay, hypothetically, we're not hypothetically, Nebraska has already opened up. Well, what if Nebraska grabs a coach, another head coach from another school? Well, then that school opens up. Mm -hmm. What if that school is now interested uh, in Kansas's OC or their DC? So it's like, yes, you're worried about the jobs that are open now, but the jobs that are open now could eventually lead to even more jobs opening up. So it's this, it's this whole cycle. And while I, I, I feel bad for Kansas fans, they're having this great year, and now they're worried about Lance Leipold potentially leaving, uh, I do – uh, sympathize with Kansas fans on, on that front, but I do feel good for them as well that, look, this is a program, and you know I know about programs that, that have been through a lot of struggles, and I know you know about programs that have been through a lot of struggles, um, so I'm happy that Kansas fans are finally able to uh, to, to rejoice and to, to have a good season and to be right on the cusp of bowl eligibility, uh, and I'm excited to watch Saturday's game. I'll be watching game day. I'll be one of those three million uh, that are tuned in to see Kansas and TCU. Michael Swain of fog.net 24 seven sports, Kansas site. You can follow him on Twitter at M Swain two, four, seven, and make sure to check out his podcast, the fog, the Kansas basketball and football podcast. Does a great job covering the Jayhawks. Michael, thanks so much for joining me and for giving me some time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Enjoyed it. So remember to like this video and subscribe to the 24 seven sports YouTube channel. And if you're listening as a podcast, make sure to give us a five-star rating and a review on Apple podcasts. So for Michael Swain, I am Lance Glenn. Enjoy week six, everyone. And thanks for listening to the College Football Daily.